Welcome to this session, which is called Building a Just Enough Admin Solution for Formula One. Uh, my name's James O'Neill. Uh, there's my contact details there. I now work as a, a freelance consultant. Uh, my little one-person company is called uh, mobularconsulting.com. Uh, this session was put together as a, as a notes from the field session, and it follows the pattern of, of most notes from the field session where we'll start off by giving you the background, introducing the whole thing, and saying what the problem was as, as we saw it. Uh, then we'll talk about what did we do, and then uh, did I learn anything from it? Um, so the, uh, the, the, the lessons piece at the end, well, I, th I hope it will become self-evident as the, as the talk goes on. So uh, a little bit on my background. Um, I spent 10 years working in, in this building. This is Microsoft's building in, uh, in the UK. Uh, that came to an end in 2010, and I went and worked for a little startup company. Um, and I went from working for Microsoft with about 100,000 employees to a company with seven. Um, that, was, that was a bit of a culture shock, and I, I found I wasn't enjoying it very much. Um, and I said, I want to be working in Formula One. I've been a Formula One fan uh, all my life. I remember being about this high and and telling my dad I was going to work in Formula One, and he said, you'll never be a racing driver. And I said, I'll be something, I'll be a mechanic or something. And he kind of looked at me and went, with your mechanical skill, you'll never be a mechanic. And then I saw an advert, and I literally went to every Formula One team's website, and I saw an advert for the Mercedes team that had my name all over it. And so I ended up working for these guys. Now, this was, a, a very, this was probably the best day of the whole day that I was here. Not just because um, this guy, who you may recognize down the front, happened to tweet this photo, um, and I'm in there. Um, I'm, I, I'm somewhere round about uh, here. I think that is actually me just there. Um, and this is the, the, what they call the race space, where they, the, those little areas off to the side are where they assemble the cars. Um, the, those of you uh, who, are, who are local might recognize the guy on the, on the right. Uh, we, we don't talk about him in my family because my, my kids are both fans of the other guy. Um, and the, uh, this gentleman in the middle has also left the team uh, recently, um, which um, came as a bit of a consolation to me. Um, this time last year, having created my job in, in 2014, uh, after about 18 months, they decided they didn't want that job to exist anymore. So um, I got out of the world of um, very fast advertising boards. Um, but I learned quite a lot when I was there, and I, I did some interesting stuff. And one of the things that I learned is, in IT, we always go and use cars as an analogy for stuff. And it's not very long when, when we go down that analogy before somebody brings up racing cars. If you only take away one thing from this session, it is that racing cars are the worst possible analogy for IT. Okay. For a start, you saw our two users on that previous thing. We only had two users, right? And everybody else in the team's in support. Now, that's depending on how you count them. You could say that's 700 people who actually make the chassis, or you can add in the people that make the engines. But it's two users, 700 people in support. Anybody else work in an organization with the, the support ratio slewed that way? We only use the cars. About 10 hours a race, I was trying to work it out, it's probably more like eight and a half hours a race, 20 races a year, so we don't, use, we don't actually use the system for more than 400 hours before we throw it away and redesign it. You're also never more than a couple of hours from rebooting it. Um, and 95% availability is okay. If you lose a car for one race, actually that's kind of accepted, and usually you can blame it on user error. But here's the real, real thing that, that is wor that, that's why this environment is actually an interesting environment to talk about. Does anybody here feel, oh yeah, in my business they give us loads of time to do everything? No, funny that. No, no IT person has ever said, the biggest problem I have is figuring out how to fill the day up. But if you work in a, in a bank, banking tends to inform how you go about doing the other things in the business. If you work for a law firm, same thing. If you work for a racing car company, there's a philosophy that comes with building cars. And that is, 
you have to get the advantage as soon as possible. It's no good saying, I've got this great idea that will make the car a couple of tenths of a second a lap faster and I can have it ready for the end of the season. They want it now. Preferably, they want it yesterday. Okay? So the mentality is always do the thing that delivers the benefit, do it as quickly as possible, and then if you're going to retain it, make it sustainable. But doing it quickly is more important than doing it properly. And somebody called this the fire ready aim school of doing IT. Okay, think about that one. So, um, within Mercedes, we had an awful lot of what I describe as technical debt. Uh, small IT department trying to do a lot of things and not always going back and cleaning up after themselves. So I went there primarily to look after Lincoln Exchange. My first day there, they said, oh, you know some SQL as well. Can you go and help the HR department? They've got a big problem with their SQL servers. Okay, so I went and did that. And I had an idea that the HR department actually had very good data about who was working for the company. I then started looking inside Active Directory. Um, I, don't, I don't know how international the phrase a can of worms is, but I prized the lid off and there were worms everywhere. Active Directory had lots of wrong data, lots of out-of-date data, lots of machines that were in there that no longer existed, lots of users who still had live accounts even though they no longer worked for the company. I found somebody who been there for a year, for a week's work experience in 2007, and their account was still live. So we started to say, we've got to get control over this. We need to remove some of the dead objects. And because I came from Microsoft, Microsoft have an internal system called Head Tracks, which basically is their HR system, and it hot links to Active Directory. So the day I left Microsoft, I actually went home and I thought, I'm going to test this. Can I still connect to my uh, Outlook account? And 8 o'clock at night, I could. 9 o'clock at night. 5 past midnight, my account was disabled. Or, round about midnight, a scheduled task ran that went, he finished working for the company today, his, his logon's disabled. So I wanted something along those lines inside of Mercedes-Benz Grand Prix. So I wrote a PowerShell script to do it and showed this to people, and I, I made myself a hero temporarily. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the head of HR was absolutely astonished when some stuff in, in um, SharePoint actually started to show organizing, organizational information correctly, that we actually had the right managers now in Active Directory. The problem was, I did this the quick and easy way. I wrote a script that ran as admin. So just think, if you're, if, you, if you're an AD person, you run get AD computer, pipe to stop computer. And you stick that in a script that runs as admin, because it ran on a server where it was easier to get local admin rights on the server than it was to get domain admin rights. Oh, we found far, far too many people had domain admin rights. Um, imagine that I then scheduled that task to run, oh, I don't know, five minutes before qualifying. Um, you can imagine the damage you could do. Funnily enough, when they told me I was leaving, um, they, they paid me this huge compliment. They said, we're not going to disable your domain admin privileges. And I kind of went, oh, that's really good. They said, because if you do anything, you're the only person that's smart enough to do some of this stuff, and we'll know that it was you. Okay. So that was the kickoff for a Just Enough Admin solution. It was built from scratch. And it pulled together Active Directory, Exchange. Um, it was originally linked, but while I was there, we upgraded to Skype for Business. But we also had to link to the HR database, which was just plain SQL. And we were making our first steps with Office 365. So um, BlackBerry had been a sponsor of the team up to the end of the 2015 season. Um, their sponsorship ran its course. They decided not to renew. Um, and we then said, oh, we mustn't have any Blackberries seen uh, in people's hands when, when the team goes to the track for the start of the 2016 season. So we had to change everything over. And the first thing we deployed was Microsoft Intune. Um, and we needed to, to hook all of that lot up as well as part of this solution. 
So where were we, uh, where were we trying to go? That, that's the kind of problem statement. Where were we trying to get to as, as an end goal? The first thing I wanted to do was to make sure that scheduled tasks didn't run with admin privileges. One of the other things that came out from, um, from doing this audit I did of, our, of Active Directory was we did find some user accounts belonging to people who no longer work there that were being used as service accounts. And we said, oh, we'll, ju we'll just disable that account and we'll, we'll figure out what's, what, what's actually logging in with it. And I got told, oh, no, don't do that because that guy used to work in the wind tunnel. And if you disable that account and you stop something running in the wind tunnel, we only are allowed a certain number of hours use of the wind tunnel by the governing body. And if you prevent the wind tunnel running, um, all hell breaks loose. So we kind of figured out what we then had to put on our, uh, our remedy list. We also wanted to automate some standard procedures. The guys who worked on the front line in IT were doing click, click, click type admin to set up user accounts. So they'd create a user, create their mailbox, enable them for link, uh, then go back and enable them for a link phone uh, and then add uh, exchange voicemail. Um, and they were not doing this stuff correctly. Um, I, if you read some of my blog posts going back probably more than 10 years, I get really wound up by the fact that people can't put a phone number in correctly. Okay? This seems to be a universal human problem, but it's worse in the UK. Um, we have this habit of, of writing our, our phone numbers so that nobody can dial them internationally. Um, and we found that they were also doing an awful lot of connecting to servers using terminal services because they hadn't installed the local tools on their local machines. So we needed to try and get rid of that um, and cover all those. And also to cut down the number of things that said, oh, yeah, somebody needs to do that in PowerShell. James, can you come and do it? So we wanted to get rid of some of those. Um, we kept adding commands to the list, but the, the, the basic gist of what we had was this array of commands. I'm not going to describe each one, but you can see we, uh, I divided them into columns for turning stuff on, turning stuff off, finding it and changing it. And um, you can see they're kind of grouped um, functionally there. We had one or two little things. If there are any link people in the room, there's, um, there's now a better tool for it, but there's a, there was a tool at the time called Cepheutil. And one of the things that we actually needed to do was to say, this person is now going to have their own extension number, but they're not physically going to have a phone. So we need to set them up a phone number and then say their phone will ring on, the, on, on this other phone. So people who worked actually on the, in the factory part of the, of the operation making things, um, they didn't sit in front of a PC, they didn't have their own phone. So we said, we want them to have their own phone number, we want them to have their own voicemail, but their phones are always going to forward. So we, we set that in. And we started with a the, with the list of things for the scheduled script, and then we just kept adding things to it. I knew when I was being successful, when the people on the help desk were actually saying, can we have another command that will do this? And so that, that was the, the first sign of success. So all this was written as a PowerShell constrained endpoint. That's the fundamental thing around JEA. And these are the bits of PowerShell that we need to implement all of this. So one of the things is private commands. Okay? We can hide commands from the user in that constraint session. Another one is uh, proxy functions. Um, we, can take a fun uh, we can take a commandlet and we can replace it with a function with the same name and change its functionality. Um, so I've given an example there on the slide. Um, we let people change group memberships, but only to put people in the um, in groups that began with department underscore. So if you worked in if you worked in IT, you could say, oh, this person's moved from um, being uh, in aerodynamics to being in um, mechanical design and I'm moving them from between departments, that's easy, but we couldn't add them to the board of directors group. Um, also, on this list of features, we need the restricted language modes of PowerShell, which stop you going and uh, interfering with the things that have set, been set up further up. 
and we rely on remote PowerShell sessions to make all this work. Now, the session itself gets elevated privilege, and we'll see how that works as we go on. But the user connects from a standard account. There's much more on this coming out of Microsoft, but we needed a customized solution. We couldn't take some of the ready-made stuff that Microsoft were doing, so we built this from scratch. There's a really good presentation that Jeffrey gave, and it's called something like Just Enough Admin, Something for a Post-Snowden World. I don't know if any of you, any hands up if you've seen that? So really good presentation. If you haven't seen it, it's well worth going and watching. So let me do a quick demonstration here of a couple of these pieces. So very quickly, um, here's, a, here's um, a proxy function. Let me just make the font a bit bigger as well because I think that will make life a little bit easier. So I haven't, I'm not running with admin privileges here, but you can see that if I try and run that command to restart the spooler service, that command runs quite happily. Now, I've got a proxy function here, and this function is also called restart service. Okay, it supports should process, so I can actually define that function. And now if I go and run the same command again, surprisingly enough, it comes back and it says, oh no, you don't. Okay, so I've taken that function out of, uh, that, that name out of use. Now, I can come to a different, a different implementation of that here, and I can say, if the service name is spooler, then actually tell me what you're restarting, and then give this fully qualified path to the command, and otherwise say, um, no, you don't. So if I define it, if I go and run that one, you can see now if I run this, it will actually restart the spooler service. Or in fact, it says it, it says it is, but it's running with what if. But if I say um, restart, start, service, uh, server, it just comes back and says, no, you can't do that. So very quickly, I can define a wrapper for functions which stops the user from, um, from, from using the full functionality of them. Or I can add functionality to them. And there's quite a lot on, of, of work on proxy functions. Now, over here, I've got a second tab because I'm actually going to, to ruin my PowerShell environment in this tab. So here, I'm going to define a function called jump. Okay, and jump, you can see, is really almost acting like, a, like an alias. It, all it does is it runs set location. So I can do jump to my modules folder, and that's fine. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define set location and set its visibility to private. Okay, now you should know that CD is an alias for set location. If I try and do CD backslash, the error message I get, and I apologize if the red's not terribly readable on here, but it says set location is not recognized as a command. So CD is still an alias for set location, but I've hidden set location. Nobody can get to set location except this jump command. Okay, so because it's private, it's not been removed completely, and jump can still use that command. So I can now hide that command, take that away from the user, but use it in a restricted way in my own function. And I can go a stage further. Now, you might notice here, I've got my, uh, my prompt. Um, uh, I'm gonna just change to my home. Of course, that won't work, will it? Um, I can move to my home directory. You can see my prompt's working. And now I'm going to set my uh, language settings to no language. And watch what happens to the prompt first of all. Okay, my prompt's gone. Okay, so let's do something like uh, get command. 
Ah, can't use get command. Can I evaluate an expression? No. In fact, I basically completely ruined the command prompt at this point. Okay, that's why there's a warning in here for me saying, do this in a new tab, because that, that tab's now effectively unusable. Okay, so we can restrict the language, we can, and we can change the commands. And the last thing I just wanted to show here, um, there is a little bit of security strangeness. Um, I'll show you later on why having my credentials in this session uh, doesn't work. In fact, to save a little bit of time, I'm just going to switch to the admin version of this. Um, so there is a little bit of strangeness here, which says, if I load my credentials and I try and connect to the local machine without specifying those credentials, I get what, what appears to be a Kerberos error. Okay, if I now try and run specify my credentials, you can see at the bottom I have actually got into the session. But this only affects this one account on this computer. I don't know if it's because it's the default account, I don't know if it's because it's linked to a Microsoft account or what it is, but you'll see with the other account I'm going to use later on, it doesn't apply to all accounts. And here I can get the configurations of the different PowerShell endpoints. So on this machine, I've currently got one defined named printers, and I'm going to redefine that a bit later on. So what I'm just going to do here is um, remove that uh, configuration and restart the WinRM service. Okay. Now, these endpoints are fundamental to how all of this works. So if you just make a normal connection to the endpoint, like I did as administrator there, you'll get a PowerShell version. Uh, this is a, a slide from, the, from PowerShell 4 when I was actually using it uh, at Mercedes. You might have noticed on my screen it was saying PowerShell 5.1. Well, that's all quite normal. Um, but the endpoints have names. So this one, the one at the bottom for my constrained endpoint is going to be called remote admin. The default one, if you don't specify one, is called Microsoft.PowerShell. Um, the constrained endpoint has got a startup script. So you can see there's a path to the startup script. The standard one's got no restrictions, no startup environment set for it at all. Um, the constrained one runs as a user that's got elevated privileges. So you can see here, um, I'm using a, um, a user called whatever the domain name is, AD Updates. That user's got admin rights. And when I connect to that session, that's the user that I, I, whose account I'm going to be using. Normally, you use your own account. Okay, so that's the difference between the top one and the bottom one there. And then finally, we have a different set of users who are allowed to connect. So for the normal one, only people who are either admins or members of remote management users can connect. And here, we've just bolted on the whole of the IT department. So now, if you're just a random IT user with a non-privileged account, you can come in and you can use that endpoint. Now that means that provided you can remember the name of the server and the name of the endpoint, you can go anywhere create a session, and then use that session remotely. So you don't have to install anything on your, on your computer. You can import the commands from the session. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, that will create a temporary module on that system, or you can save that module. And actually, we say it took the saved version, and we added some enhancements to it to make life easier for the users. So to build the script, what we need to do is figure out what, first of all, what modules we need in the script. So we load those modules and we specify either the minus commandlet switch or the minus function switch. So we only load the commands from those modules that we actually want. 
right? We don't just go and load everything. We just go, right, in this environment, we're going to have just these commands. Then we decide what commands will be visible, and by default, we're going to make everything invisible. Okay? Now, PowerShell has a minimum required set of functions. So if you've connected to a session and you've hidden everything, there's no way to check what commands are available, and there's no way to even exit the session. So there's about seven commands that are in this minimum required set, and they're actually set up as proxy functions. So we import those. And then most of the work is business logic and proxy functions. So there was a command in, in there, you might have seen it on the big table that I had, which was initialize user. And that would create their account, set their manager, uh, give them a phone number, provision them for link, provision them for exchange, provision them for enterprise voice, voicemail, the whole works. And it did the, the whole lot in one go. Um, that accounted for about 1,800 lines of script in the, in the, in the final, uh, final script. And then the last thing is we set the language mode. Now, I'm not going to, I put these in the slide deck simply so that you have a copy, okay? Um, I will tweet and I will, I will use the conference hashtag. Um, I will tweet where these slides are. They will be, I'll also put on my blog where they are. But the, the, I'm not going to go through this line by line, but basically that just says, um, for every command, hide the commands. And don't allow any applications or any scripts to run. And for testing, I just said, don't do this if you're running in the PowerShell ISE. So I could run the script in the PowerShell ISE, and I wouldn't turn everything off so that I could then make sure that stuff was working. This is the, um, you, you have to do a bit of a search to find this, but this is the, the, the thing for adding the um, minimum commands and setting the language mode. And again, don't do it if you're in the, in the ISE. Now, that run as account that we were talking about saves you getting involved with what everybody knows as the double hop problem. Anybody not familiar with the double hop problem with credentials? So when you connect to a server and you need to connect to a further server, it turns around and says, ah, I can't use the credentials that you've just used to log in here to connect to another server. And this frequently happens in a link world where you say, oh yes, I'll remote onto a link server to run PowerShell commands remotely. And then the first thing that happens is the link server says, ah, I can't talk to Active Directory. Oh, great, okay. Um, if you're using run as for your remote endpoint, the session has the credentials, so it can do that hop onto the, onto the next server. Um, Exchange also uses um, remoting. Exchange remoting is slightly different, and again, I've just included this for completeness. It's a slightly different syntax for making the, making the session, but here you can see we've got a command that was get a list of Exchange mailbox databases. Um, you can see sort isn't one of the uh, minimum set of commands, so I can use sort in the ordinary format, but select object is, so I have to use the fully qualified name for select object. Um, and if I need to specify credentials, then I've got this question of what, how do I actually store credentials for connecting out to Office 365, for example? And the answer is, you save the credentials to an XML file. Now, um, I'm just going to demonstrate this because, again, this is something that um, not everybody seems to know. So, um, if I, in fact, I'm going to cheat here. I've already, oh, sorry. Let me try that again. So I already have here a file um, called password.xml. Okay? And that password.xml contains a secure string. So you can see here, here's the secure string. And that was the command to basically get a credential and um, export it to that, that file there. Now, I can import the credential. That all seems to work fine. And if I show you the network credential part of it, you can see 
that uh, the password for my user, demo user, is demo user with a capital D. Okay, no need for Mimi Cats here. We've actually got the thing in beautiful clear text. So I can now go and start a copy of PowerShell as that user. And if I do, who am I? Who am I? If I can type who am I properly, you can see that I'm on there as that user demo user. But if I do type password.xml, you can see the same file. But if I try and import that file, I get an error. Okay, The only user that can decode that secure string is the user who encoded it. Okay, So that secure string is safe because only the person that created the, the secure string can decode it. So now I've got an environment where um, I can actually save passwords with a relative degree of safety and not have to have them lying around in plain text. But this led to another problem. Okay, And the other problem was we're, all, we're logging in and we're using that um, admin account that everybody's allowed to use, but any logging we do will only say, oh yeah, um, the, um, the um, update AD user uh, enabled a user for exchange. The update AD user did this, the update AD user did that. So we basically had to log everything that we did. So again, just for completeness, run that command once as an administrator to create your own source for, for log messages and then at the start of the script, this line here gets the name of the user who's actually logged in and using the session. And now we can write to the log, okay, this user logged on, and then each time we do something, we can log the actions that they took. These two lines here, as it says, are the, are the, the first two lines in the script proper. So you get an example that says, uh, and this is a real live example, we changed Barry somebody or other, um, obviously, we've, uh, we've crossed that out, and Barry became a something or other technician. And you can see I've actually scrubbed out the name of who changed it. And then we, we, we followed a sort of, um, almost like um, the uh, style of numbers that they use in FTP and HTTP and SMTP, where you have particular ranges of numbers that mean particular things. So anything that was uh, began with a one, we were doing something to an AD user. If it began with a two, we were doing something to a mailbox. If it began with three, we were doing something to a link account. And then 102 was we changed a property on the user. 103 was we added them to a group. So you can see the next one down to 103. So um, let's actually show you the process of creating an endpoint and uh, um, using an endpoint and creating a module for it. So, um, I've created a little endpoint, a little script file here, um, and you can see. I've got that, get the uh, assumed user, write the uh, information to the event log, and then I'm going to pull in just the get printer function from the print management module. Uh, then I'm going to hide everything. I've got some business logic here, so I've got a command restart spooler. Um, and I should be doing this, excuse me, I need to be doing this as administrator, otherwise this bit will, will not work. Sorry. Uh, let's just do that again. So, hidden all the commands, set the language mode, I've got my restart spooler command, and then I've already got my credentials loaded. No, I haven't. Let's just go and load my credentials. 
So now, if I run this command here, it will define a new PowerShell endpoint. And right on the end of that command line, there was something that says, display the, um, the UI for who can actually uh, use this endpoint. So what I'm going to do is just add my user, demo user. And I'm going to make sure they can do everything in here. And if I apply that, I've now got a new endpoint. And it warns me here that if I've just redefined that service, I might need to restart WinRM. Well, I did that earlier on, so that should be OK. And I can now connect to that session. And if I do enter ps session dollar s, you can see I've got a truncated prompt there. So that gives me a clue that um, I haven't got everything working in that session. DIR doesn't work, but get command should do. Ah, get command doesn't. Uh, yeah, it, it might help if I just use the version with two M's. Um, and you can see here, so I've got get command, get format data, get help, and I've got my two commands, get printer and restart spooler, and not much else. So I can do exit PS session. I haven't even got tab completion in there. And then I can export that and actually create a permanent module with that name uh, that matches the name PowerShell version. I'm going to skip that. Um, I happen to have that one already existing. There is a no there is a known problem and actually I uh, yes, thank you. The, the, there is a problem with exporting PS sessions and the workaround for it is provided you didn't do what you were being told to do in the security session, if you run PowerShell, with a version two switch, that export PS session works. That's how I, how I did the export before. So I can come across to my uh, demo user and just double check that I am the demo user. So if I do um, lost sight of where it is. There it is. Um, enter PS session. No, I've got two lines there. If I try and do enter the default session as that user, I'm going to get an access denied message. Okay, that user is not allowed to connect to the default session. But if I specify um, if I do um, dollar $s, in fact, let me do it a different way. I can do import module remote printers. So that's the module that I exported before the session started. And in that module remote printers, I've just got those two commands. So those were the two commands you saw in my setup script. And if I do restart spooler here, so if I try to do restart service spooler, I'm going to get an access denied message because this user hasn't got the privileges. But if I do uh, restart spooler, very quietly in the background, we set up a new session. No need to specify credentials, you notice, for this user. All worked absolutely fine. Created a remote session and it restarted the spool in the background. And if I go to my event viewer, we should be able to see here in near the top of the application log. So PS Remote Admin. Flatfish demo user restarted the spooler. So we've got event ID one, two, three. 
and here we've got that user actually logged on. So that's a really cut down, pared down minimum version of what we were doing inside Mosebi. Um, I talked about initialized user before. Initialized user takes an awful lot of parameters. Okay, you can see display name ID, blah 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 blah, blah all of those. And we built a GUI wrapper. Um, we ended up just creating a little um, WPF piece of PowerShell, and then um, I had a script that dumped all the parameters in there. And we made sure it would accept input from the pipeline. So you could actually go and query the HR database. So you could do get HR info, Fred Smith, and you'd get that information. And then you could pipe that into show initialized user, and it would fill in all the pieces for that user. So that made it even easier for the, the guys on the front line. They didn't have to know every parameter that I put in. And that was how, I'd, um, uh, how I ended up customizing the exported module. Um, you can see here we actually wrote uh, some PESTA test cases. Really, this is just here for illustration. Again, I'm not going to go through this in detail. But what we found was if you defined test cases and said, okay, so we want to check me, for example, um, you could then go and, and check that uh, when you went and got that user, you got the right information back from Active Directory. So what did we learn? Well. That's really everything that I've given you up to this point. Um, from the technical side, everything about creating an endpoint to deliver services. And we use this over and over and over again in other places. We did a, did a much simpler model where we needed to check to see whether a new machine had been added to AD and then had registered, registered itself in DNS for the first time when we were doing builds. Um, because we couldn't trust having the DNS utilities in the right places, we created a, an endpoint for just checking machines in DNS. Um, the logging thing was a, was a big lesson because we, we, we had this sudden realization that we, were, we weren't logging anything in a meaningful way, saying who'd done what. Um, the credentials problem, we're quite pleased to solve that. Um, and the GUI wrapper. I'm, I'm doing another session where I'll talk more about um, some stuff to do with PESTA. Um, but if you haven't investigated PESTA, um, I recommend that you do. Don't think of it so much about testing code. Think of it as a way that when you collapse everything down in a folding editor, it looks like a specification for what the thing does. So you can show that to somebody who is a project manager and say, okay, so this is what the thing does and what it should do. Uh, the other lessons we learned, um, yeah, I know more about technical debt and, and business inertia now than I, than I, than I realized there was to know. Um, the other thing was I started trying to do a like-for-like a, a -like replacement that didn't add anything and very quickly realized that the only way to actually add value was to start doing new things and, and help the guys on the help desk do things more quickly. So even quite simple things like we've got an employee ID for somebody, can we find that user's details? So just being able to look up a user by employee ID it turned out to be a big win for them. That was actually the thing I was saying that they came and requested. And simplifying their common tasks. Um, it I, I'm, I'm, I don't like the way people keep saying, oh yes, we do agile this and agile that and agile something else and grabbing hold of this term agile and applying it to everything. But this really was following the agile thing of deliver something, enhance it, deliver it again, test it. Oh no, you're supposed to test it first. Um, but uh, we, we, we joke that our, our, our test environment is so good, we actually put all our users in it. And the, the thing for me was we got some really good management buy-in. Actually, I think if I'd got more people in management to buy into it, maybe I'd still be working for Mercedes. So one of those things was a kind of political thing. But the stuff we got from the HR side of the house was fantastic because they were then say, oh, now you're doing this, can you add these things? So one of the things that's missing from here was they, uh, they got a photographer in to take everybody's photo. And we ended up with a, with a way that um, somebody in HR ran a script every time they got new photos, uh, which dropped pictures in a folder that my script then, when it ran on a scheduled basis, said, ah, we have to import those photos into AD. 
So that management buy-in was really, really important. It, did, it couldn't just stand on its own. There is still sand in the hourglass. And I've got to the question slide, which is unheard of for me. So are there, are there any questions while, before the sand finally runs out? Otherwise, my, my contact information is there. Uh, you're free to mail me, follow me on Twitter. And as I say, I will blog and tweet. If you're just watching the, uh, the conference hashtag, you will see a tweet from me. Uh, which has the location for where the slide deck is. Any questions? Go on then, gentlemen at the front. Why did? Uh, oh, when I was in that, so tab completion is actually a PowerShell function. And if you've disabled, so if you're in a remote session where you've, the language mode has disabled lots of PowerShell functions, as well as disabling the prompt, it disables tab completion. Gentleman over there. Um, the way that we did this, we actually create we we created a server for the of, uh, which was a virtual machine with the specific job of running all these administrative things in the background. Um, what we then had was we actually had two endpoints. So we had my test endpoint. So when I was creating new scripts, I had an endpoint on there where I could test new stuff and we had a production endpoint. And then we had additional endpoints for other functions on that server. Um, and that server also hosted the, um, the synchronization agent for, uh, for Office 365. But it was, we put all that stuff on one server. And so rather than trying to, to integrate it on, onto existing machines, we, we created a, a server specifically for it. You can probably squeeze in one more and then the next speaker will, will have me shot. But any more, any more questions? Right, in that case, enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>